Hello everyone. So today I want to do the lecture on Catcher in the Rye. If you're tuning in, then obviously you, you're you familiar with the book, but if not, uh, here it is. I have this copy by J.D. Salinger. You are probably familiar with this. You may have not read it, or you may, be, you may have been assigned it. This was like one of those typical books that were assigned in school, you know, back before many of us understood how to actually analyze books, and thankfully Sparknotes was there. But this was actually a book I did read. I didn't understand it as well, but I want to explore it far more in this lecture series and give an in-depth, detailed look. And it's it's very popular mainly with boys, but it can it's still great for women as well. But I think there's this um, rite of passage that it's a coming-of-age tale, right? And I think that's why a lot of us relate to it because we feel a lot of the same feelings. There's this idea of wanting to attach yourself to innocence but trying to figure out a way to try to transcend and break free, especially in this current generation, as we already kind of are familiar with, you know, I think it started with more millennials and now it's probably progressing, but this kind of delayed infancy in a way where childhood is just extended and there's no real rite of passages in America. I mean, college is not really a rite of passage. You're not, you're actually becoming more childish because you have less responsibilities. You can do whatever. It's just like a, a party, some summer camp. It's not, you're not really preparing yourself in adulthood, but we'll explore this. And I will just read through it because I think each line is really densely packed. So strap in, buckle in, et cetera, et cetera. For this amazing book, and you'll probably, I mean, if you don't have it, there's, it, there's copies of it on eBay for like $2. You can buy some on Amazon if you want to spend a little more money. Or your local library has copies of this book. Trust me on this. But definitely read it pick it up read through it once and then return to the series i like to read through books the first time without really just stopping to analyze and then if it really is a book i really enjoy like this i'll come back to it multiple times and it changes every time you read it as you progress in life books change for you and you start understanding them more and they start making sense i'm sure the same thing happens with film i'm not a big uh film guy i usually don't watch films more than once but i know a lot of people do and of course, once you already watched it and you go back and watch it again, you start seeing details and you piece stuff together. And this is how it is with books too. And they always present new things to you. It, something else illuminates itself to you because you've changed. So things in the book are gonna change for you and they're gonna pop out to you and speak to you in this sort of like Carl Jung way in regards to kind of a synchronicity, right? Like stuff just jumps out at you. You may peruse a library and there's a book that just hops out on you, pops out and you're just like, uh, I gotta have it. And you don't know why that happens. But then for some reason, it's like perfectly aligned with where you're at. And it's like a book you need to be reading at that current moment in your life. It's weird, but enough of that. Let's jump into the book. And if you want a background on it, just do a simple Google search. There's, I mean, there's endless things about it, but Overall, just a quick recap, it's the main character is Holden Caulfield. He's a teenage boy and he's just recounting a tale. But we'll jump into it. So he starts off chapter one if you really want to hear about it. And I want to stop here because it's a great way to start off the book because it really sets the stage. It's in opposition to the entire book, which if you haven't read it, but just trust me on this, in which Holden's trying to find anyone to listen to him. And he's having trouble to find anyone who listens. Like the whole time he's trying to find adults who actually listen to him, but no one really listens. So he's practically saying, if you really want to hear about it, and that's how he's starting off the book. And of course we want to hear about it. If you, unless you're forced and assigned this book for school, you, you want to hear about it. You're picking up the book for a reason. So um, he, he's also right off the bat, you're going to see why, but he's talking to a therapist. But the therapist in this book is also the reader in the audience. And the reader is, you know, we hopefully are eager to listen to this, all right? So the first thing we we'll start again, if you really want to hear about it, the first thing you probably want to know is where I was born and what my lousy childhood was like and how my parents were occupied and all before they had me. And all that David Copperfield kind of crap, but I don't feel like going into it if you want to know the truth. So these kind of, he has this vocab, it's very important if you read in those spark notes analysis about the vocabulary that Holden uses. He's talking like a teenager, right? saying lousy he says lousy at times like my lousy childhood and then he says like kind of crap you know that sort of immature kind of phrasing and talking 
And it's a way to kind of lessen things. If you're a teenager, you always want to child play it kind of too cool, right? You never want to say something's amazing. You want to say, hey, it was all right. It was kind of, it was kind of cool. It's, it was sort of like this. And you'll see that Colden does that quite a bit. And then, um, unless, this is something that I over, overlooked until very recently as I started to dig into the book far more. This is something that pops out, but it seems so subtle and you're, most people would just overlook it and not even think about it. But he says how my parents were occupied and it's subtle, it's brief. He kind of, you know, grazes over it and moves on and it shouldn't be moved on because it tells us a lot about Holden and his relationship to his parents, which we'll see it's not really there. It's kind of non-existent. And then what also occurs is he has such a tight bond to his siblings, right? And you'll see this in the book as well. And I think that typically happens in a lot of families. I know of some personally where the parents may not have been there for the children. They may have not been the best parents, most not most loving, but if they're siblings and they're close, a lot of the times they're bond. And it's a weird kind of thing that happens. It kind of fixes itself, right? Like you may not have that great of a relationship with your parents, but because all you guys kind of had this sort of not that great of a relationship, you, you attach yourself to the next loving person and the siblings become really close and become like best friends. And that's a reward and a gift in itself. It's a blessing. And so I think this is something so subtle and you can miss it, but once you realize the book and it ties it all together, you'll realize why that's so important. So um, once again, read this book prior. This is more so an in-depth look for people who have read the book, but you can still listen to this even if you haven't and you can look out for this and then read it after, right? It's still fine. Um, but yeah, you'll see that he's like, the parents are like aloof and they even send him off to school. Like he's not really, the love isn't really there. And then when he says, if you want to know the truth, and it's a common phrase Holden says throughout the book, which one wouldn't need to state if everything they were saying was already true. And like, if you want to know the truth, like, yeah, of course we want to know the truth. And this is important because Holden Caulfield is constantly mentioned if you listen to any of these other read any kind of detailed analysis that by educators or summary websites crash course videos they always label him as a as being an unreliable narrator and this just adds to that depiction and description of him because he says this phrase throughout the book like these sort of phrases indicating that there may be lies or falsehoods sprinkled throughout the story and of course, as, as a therapist or as a reader, listener, you want to know the truth if someone's going to talk about their lives. And how truthful is, is the recounting of lives, to be honest. There's always going to be f fiction mixed with truth because the memory is you know, tainted. It's not the most reliable thing. All right, let's move on to the next spot. In the first place, that stuff bores me. And in the second place, my parents would have about two hemorrhages apiece if I told anything pretty personal about them. They're quite touchy about anything like that, especially my father. They're nice and all, I'm not saying that, but they're touchy as hell. So, first, in the first place, that stuff bores me. This is Holden's immature language, once again, is phrasing. Because it's like he mentions that first before the second reason about his parents, which seems to be the more of the real reason. Because he elaborates on that more than telling you why that stuff bores him, right? If he really bored him, he would probably describe why it's so boring. Like, yeah, it just bores me because this is this. But instead, he, he tells you about his parents more. And Holden, uh, once again, throughout the book, you'll see he gives a couple reasons for his actions or his thoughts or opinions. And there's, there's a little truth in both of those things. But there's one reason that always holds more truth and it's more, a more of a dominant reason. And you'll probably notice that in your own life. I know I do that quite frequently. Is that we have all these rational reasons for why we do certain things and why we have opinions. And there may be a real reason, but we don't want to admit it. Instead, we like one better and say, well, you know, it's kind of it's kind of stupid anyway, it's this and that. Oh, it's because I'm doing this. Like these other reasons that kind of protect our ego in a way versus something that's really probably really true, which is the fact that it's more so probably about his parents. He's one really open about them because I think that's opening up about more of himself and his relationship to them, which he doesn't want to do. But he still wants to mention it. And then once when you're reading this, or I'll point it out when I can, I'm not going to point it out every time because it's too, too frequent, but he says phrases like pretty personal about anything like that, they're nice and all. And I want you to question, like, what does that indicate? And to me, it says it indicates that Holden is rarely ever firm about anything. 
He can't ever truly commit or state something as complete. It seems to always have to be not set in stone, like rather ambiguous, and it gives him wriggle, wiggle room to operate. And I'll continue to call for it, but yeah, it's like, it's the kind of talk that we all have in a way. Pretty personal about like that and all. It's not just saying they're nice. And then Holden tends to engage in hyperboles, and a hyperbole is a form of an overstatement that is not meant to be taken literally. So in other words, it's just an exaggerated claim, not meant to be serious. And he does this quite frequently as well, which I personally like. I love exaggeration. Maybe I'm, I'm still childish. Maybe that's a childish thing, but I think it's funny. But an example of the hyperbole is when Holden claims that his parents would have two hemorrhages apiece if he told anything personal about them. And you notice this throughout the novel, and of course that's probably not true, but he wants to say to try to make a point, because Holden will go to more exaggerated claims to try to make his point. And once I'll point this out, and you'll see it happen. And I know I do that, and I'm sure a lot of us do that, where we want people to look at things from our opinion, or really want to push a point, because it's not, it, it doesn't seem like justified when you just say, well, my parents wouldn't like if we talked about them, pretty personal. That's something simple, but you want to make it seem exaggerated. And you have to ask yourself why, and why would Holden want to do that? And why do you want to do that if you do do that? Sorry about that fridge. That was a noise, you heard it. And then critics of Holden's, like I said, will say that his use of hyperbole makes him seem immature. And that suggests that he doesn't trust the reader to believe the simple facts of his story. And thinks that the, he thinks he needs to exaggerate and embroider the statement to make them more convincing, right? Like that, you can't just say, they're not gonna, they're not gonna like if I talk about it. He has to say why they're going to have hemorrhages if I talk about it. And in this the little subtle hints too, I think we learn, I'm just picking this up, that it seems as his parents are very concerned with their public image and do not like opening up about their private lives. And this could be a reason why Holden has trouble being open and honest with the reader and with himself is because, and maybe why he ended up in a mental institution, because he has no one to really be honest and open about and he's trying to keep this, this balance of this image right, this perfect imagery, kind of have to hold things in too. Because if, if his parents would not open up about the private lives, then why would he be any different, especially his father? Because unfortunately, most boys emulate their father, whether they like it or not. Right? Even if you don't have the best relationship, you want to be completely different, you're going to have certain habits and things that are going to remind you of your father and it may make you re repulsed of yourself and freak you out and you don't want to admit it. Or there's that unconscious and subconscious idea of wanting to please your parents, even if you dislike your parents, right? You may hate your father, but deep down you want his respect. You want him to be proud of you. It's, it's like this curse that's casted on children, unfortunately. And then he uses the word nice to describe them. And I want to point out this adjective because you will quickly see that he uses this term to describe many people, a multitude of them. The term itself is not that descriptive if you really think about it. Nice is so, it's rather vague. What comes to your mind when you think of someone who's nice? So ponder about that, right? Someone's nice. And usually when I think, yeah, they're nice, it's like, it's a pleasant person, If you, but they're forgetful, right? It's a forgetful, for, forgetful adjective. It's kind of just dismissing the person being okay. They didn't try to kill you. You didn't mind being in the same room as them, but they weren't memorable. They're just nice. So um, pay attention to that. Because he uses it to describe other people too. It's a safe descriptive word and you'll see certain things i want i'll point them out too where holden when he really cares about something or really passionate or meaningful about it uh something that's meaningful important he'll open up and get very descriptive and kind of drag on but when he wants to get past something he just moves on it really quick says oh that's nice and is very limited in his description and that could also could also be parts of himself that he does want to open up about. So he closes it down and tries to make it just, you know, pass by it really quick. I'll just say it's nice and we can move forward because he probably does want to talk about his parents and his relationships to that. And I think we do that quite often too. And I'm saying we as me and anyone else who is listening, who deals with that. Okay, uh, I'm not going to tell you my whole goddamn autobiography or anything like that. I'll just tell you about this madman stuff that happened to me around last Christmas, just before I got pretty run down and had to come out here and take it easy. So there's this whole thing about the goddamn, that's his phrase he uses, this sort of, you know, it's sort of cursing, but also kind of a way that young people talk, right? 
And another indication, I think it's starting to be clear that he ended up in a mental institution. That's where he's at currently in this book because he must go through various therapies to assist them. The indicators are madman. Uh, I got pretty run down. I had to come out here and take it easy. And that's possibly a nice way for himself, his own ego, to say that he needed a break instead of saying that he had a mental breakdown, which is a lot harder to say and harder to admit. So in a way you're like, yeah, I just needed something, which it, it's true, it's a nice way to put it, but perhaps he doesn't want to own up to the fact that he had a mental breakdown. And then, like I said, I'm not going to tell you my whole, auto, whole goddamn autobiography or anything. That's like his famous and notorious way that he speaks. You'll see tons of people speaking that way if you ever go on any videos on YouTube. And he doesn't ever state anything with confidence or anything, and he's notorious for leaving things rather vague and open, and of course the goddamn. And it's a it's 1950s era slang. That's is when this book is kind of taking place, around that time, because I, be, I believe it was copyrighted in 46, so it's starting to be in the 50s, right? Yeah, 46, 51. And like lousy, swell, curse words like hell, damn, goddamn, they're dropped frequently throughout the book, and you'll see it. And much as uh, Holden is, self, is a self-described exhibitionist who shows off to impress other people, and this use of slang and profanity draws attention to itself, suggesting he's trying to create an impression of himself as like, you know, tough and rebellious, which kids try to do when they're first growing up, right, and through high school, because he's a high school kid. And if you think back to when you were in high school, the slang words you would use, right, to be cool, what people said, and slang words change all the time, right? I don't even know what the new word is for cool. That one changes so frequently. Is it still dope or lit? One of those two, or unless it's probably change, but it's always changing. Um, but also in addition to making, to marking his desire to be seen as rebellious, Holden's language also indicates his immaturity. Rather than using profanity for emphasis or to express extreme emotion, Holden uses words like goddamn as verbal placeholders. And this is, Tech, well, Mr. Spencer, who you'll see later in the book, points this out as intellectual laziness, to use that as like a placeholder. Hold, like Holden, the other boys at Pincy swear and use slang frequently. And like I mentioned earlier, this is common with age. So like think about slang terms you used. And do you curse more when you're around your friends than when you're speaking with others, especially adults? And I would say, yeah, I remember being a teenager, like when you're with your friends, you know, your homies. You're always, you know, shooting the crap and you'll be talking a lot, a lot differently than you would do. You'd be talking with teachers or parents or like your parents or your friend's parents, adults. And then let's continue with the book. I mean, that's all I told DB about and he's my brother and all. He's in Hollywood. That isn't too far from this crummy place. And he comes over and visits, visits me practically every weekend. And so once again, another indication that he's in some sort of like mental institution, uh, a sort of retreat for the psychically ill, because if his brother's coming to visit him at this place, crummy place, he wants to put it down again, use those terms. And he's talking to a therapist and has discussed this with DB, everything he's going to tell the therapist. So the fact that Holden feels obligated to mention to the therapist that he's going to tell them everything he told DB, who's his brother, meaning that he won't go any further, right? Almost as if this is a very intimate story that he's going to tell and share with the therapist and us, the readers, since it was shared with his own brother. Uh, it's almost a sort of caveat too that he's not gonna go any further. Since if he didn't tell his brother more, why would he tell the readers or the therapist more than necessary? And then once again, pay attention to the way you hold and use his phrases like, he's my brother and all. Why that make he just, he's my brother. Right, that's all he has to say, but he says, and all afterwards. He does this all the time. And then practically every weekend. Instead of saying every weekend, practically every weekend. This is similar to the phrases, anything like that, or, or anything. Holden, like, like I mentioned previously, doesn't like to set anything in stone. He keeps his language very open. And then it still displays his insecurity and immaturity. His inability to commit, his inability to truly choose and just clamp down on something, right? Speakers, sales reps, anyone in a leadership position understands that they cannot use language considered weak or a language that makes one seem unsure about themselves their, or their ideas or the products or services. If they're talking like that, they're typically not going to get a sale. They're not going to instill confidence in whoever they're speaking to. 
if they want them to, to buy them, right? If they're selling something or just talking, people are not going to really believe you if you speak in an uncertain way because they think if you're speaking uncertain, that means you're uncertain with yourself. So why, if you're uncertain with yourself, why would I be confident in you and certain with you, certain in you? Once again, it must just be firm and confidently said to convey security, confidence, and assurance with the audience, with Hol which Holden does not do. Probably why many people think he's an unreliable narrator. And yeah, because he's unsure with his language. It's, it's probably because of his in immaturity, which comes with, you know, insecurity. The two kind of coincide, right? It's rare if someone's immature, like if you're insecure, you're still gonna be immature in a lot of ways. The two kind of correspond and correlate. But I, I do wanna additionally point out that we're all indeed unreliable narrators. We see things through a limited subjective perspective and memory is notoriously unreliable. Therefore, the vast majority of our stories contain false fillers. And if it was told by another, it would vary from being very slightly different to very different, depending on who's retelling it, who's recounting the story from their perspective. And if we were an objective observer, we would have a different memory of the same experience. Like the only reliable narrator is life itself. People themselves are not reliable because everyone has their own biases, their own judgments, their own experiences from that perspective. And it's so limited that, yeah, it differs. You can, I'm sure if you've had this experience, if you get together with friends or family and you guys recount a memory, a shared memory, a shared experience, and you tell the stories of it, it's going to differ, right? Some of you may even argue about what something was like, oh no, it wasn't that day. We didn't eat at that restaurant, we ate at this restaurant. And you're like, no, no, we ate at this restaurant on the day. No, we didn't. And then you see these different, that kind of stuff. And I'm sure you can think of many examples of that nature. So even though they're always criticizing Holden for being unreliable, I think we're all unreliable narrators. My bold statement for tonight. Let's get back to the book. He's going to drive me home when I go home next month. Maybe. Once again, Holden says the word maybe. He's constantly uncertain and can't seem to ever just say something with absolute certainty. And this is frustrating. Right? If you had a friend or a romantic partner who talked like this, how quickly would you lose it? Right, or break up with them. I'm going to come back home in an hour. Maybe. I'm free to hang out on Saturday. Maybe. Etc. The maybe is a sign of immaturity, especially in regards to relationships when you can't get yourself to commit. And I think that is very prominent and easily identifiable in today's society, especially with smartphones. Like people are, every, people are scared to commit to anything, like plans. If you're trying to make plans with somebody, it is the most frustrating thing in today's age because in the past, you just have to commit. Like if you call somebody and say, hey, meet me at here at, at 7 p.m. on Saturday. And then you just have to hope they're gonna, going to show up and they're more reliable. But now people don't have to commit because everything's instant communication. So if someone changes their mind, they can text you, you know, 10 minutes before and say, actually, I'm not coming, right? And people always wanna keep their plans open because we all have this FOMO, right? There could be something else that comes up. So we don't wanna commit ourselves to some plan if something else comes up. And yeah, I think many people are turning into Holden being, not committing. And the interesting thing is that he's going to talk about the past. And even though he's currently in therapy, he still suffers from the same tendencies and insecurities that led him to where he is currently in the present. Because as we'll see in the book, Holden does grow, but he's still, he's, he, this is where he's at now older and he's telling about the past. So he's grown a little, but he's still very immature and still suffers from the same insecurities as immaturity. And this is something that always happens with us. Rarely is anyone fully individuated in Jung's terms, right? Self-individuation, no one really achieves that. You're constantly, I don't really like the butterfly analogy because sure it may work for some people, but I think that's too big of a transformation, right? A caterpillar into becoming this beautiful butterfly. I think we're more, I think this, the serpent's more um, analogous and more correct because it's still the same creature. It sheds its skin constantly. And it's like, that's what we're doing. We're constantly shedding our skin and then getting out of that and doing it again and again and again, over and over again. And though we got new skin and we may be a little different, right? Move a little better. We're still the same snake. Like people still 
are going to have a lot of the same, are still going to be the same person, but they're making small adjustments. Not this, it's rare when you have a giant adjustment. It does happen, you know, like the butterfly kind of effect, but it's, it's a lot more rare. I think throughout life, it's a lot of small incremental changes and improvements on yourself or descending, which happens as well. Sometimes you drop down, right? You get worse off, which can happen with the skin too. But if they don't get proper nutrients, their skin's not going to grow and nice. It's like you're not getting the proper nutrients for yourself, whether it be mentally, spiritually, physically, you're gonna you're gonna wither and you're not gonna be as as healthy. Let's get back to the book. He, DB, just got a Jaguar. It can do 200 miles an hour. It cost him damn near 4,000 bucks. He's got a lot of dough now. He didn't used to. He used to be just a regular writer when he was home. He wrote this terrific book of short stories, The Secret Goldfish, in case you never heard of him. The best one in it was about this little kid that wouldn't let anybody look at his goldfish because he thought, because he bought it with his own money. So Holden's extremely focused and concerned about money in this paragraph and in regards to DB. It's almost as if he's both proud of him, but also slightly upset with his brother. And we can hold conflicting views and conflicting opinions about people. And that's something that people don't want to know. Like love and hate a lot of the times are both present in us. I'm sure if you think about someone you love, whether it be friends, right, family, romantic partner. There's moments in the, that you love them and hate them and you can hold both those views at the same time. And even this almost envy and admiration and respect all kind of blend in together as well. So back to the book, he wrote terrific books when he was home and a regular writer according to Holden, but he also makes it a point to let the therapist reader know that his brother is successful now and that he's talented. And the story is interesting because it's a kid buying something and not allowing anyone to look at it, almost as if he doesn't want to share the experience, but wants to be greedy, to keep, to have possessions and treasures, and to shield these from the world. The only reason he doesn't want anyone to look at the goldfish is because he bought it, rather than something like because he loves it or it is his treasure. Right? It's saying because he bought it with his own money that he wants to keep. It's like sharing your treasure, the, the dragon hoarding his gold and not sharing it with the world. The secret goldfish, right? And he uses goldfish too, gold, money. So, yeah, but clearly his brother has got to be these things. So he's gonna tell you how he's got his money. So now he's out in Hollywood, DB, being a prostitute. If there's one thing I hate, it's the movies. Don't even mention them to me. So you sense what, animosity and slight disappointment in his brother. He admired him when he was a writer, but he thinks that DB prostituted himself out for money and has become a writer for movies in Hollywood, like he liked when he was writing short stories. And this kind of happens. I, I do this too, and I'm sure millions of other people do this. I'm not alone in this, is you'll see somebody you really enjoy, a creative artist, could be, you know, a director, could be, a lot of the times it's in music, there be like their secret and then they become big and the music's a little different and everyone starts thinking they sold themselves out, right? They're making pop music, they're making mop, music for the masses, they're sold out, they're not the same. And you feel like you, you're you like disappointed with them, right? You kind of get annoyed, like, well, how did you sell yourself out, right? And he has this with his brother, clearly. And then what's interesting is you'll see uh, Holden as is you'll see Holden's as you continue to read and I'll point out Holden's a uh, sense of morality and virtue he like all of us seems to always judge people from his own value structure right we can't help it we have our own biases our own idea of what's right and wrong and we pretend and truly believe that we know what is right and wrong and we can oh, some we have this way of judging people we, we judge people all the time it's automatic it's out of habit in nature it's subconscious even when you look at somebody, even when you don't want to judge someone, you have to consciously and consistently remind yourself, like, not judge, don't judge, don't judge, don't judge. But Holden is like this, especially when you're young, it's, I feel like it's even worse. I know for me it was, because when you get into college, you start learning more knowledge and you start to think that you know better than everyone else. Like the rest of the world is like this corrupt place that doesn't know any better. And you you and your people around you, like this echo chamber. and in your, the college that you're in with your friends, you, you all think that you know what's best for the world, you're going to change the world, and everyone else doesn't know what's right. And you try to, you put yourself on this like moral pedestal, and you want to feel superior to everyone else. And you'll see this with Holden, even at his, young, his age, he'll, he'll constantly try to make himself superior. And it's like an ego thing that always happens. And 
moral uh, Holden making a moral judgment on his brother is a foreshadowing of the rest of the book where you'll see Holden make judgments about everyone he meets. And the funny thing too is he talks about the film and hating them. The funny the thing is JD Salinger just uh a trivia point is that he really did hate the films. That's the reason the Catching Rye has never been made into the film, into a film because he hated film. But Holden talks about it like he hates it, but he goes to the movies multiple times throughout the book. And I'll point them out. So where I want to start telling the is what I want where I want to start telling is the day I left Pincy Prep. Pincy is the school that's in Adrian's town, Pennsylvania. You probably heard of it. You've probably seen the ads anyway. They advertise in about a thousand magazines, always showing some hotshot guy on a horse jumping over a fence. I never even once saw a horse anywhere near that place. So this is where Holden chooses to start the story. Thus it holds importance, right? Leaving Pincy Prep, though he says I left Pincy. And we find out later in this chapter that Holden flunked out, therefore he was kicked out. He didn't leave on his own decision, his own free will. He had no choice. It is another way to shield his ego, which he does all the time. And we all do that, right? We always wanna make it seem like it's a little better. So you'll see people sometimes who get fired and they wanna say that they quit or they didn't like the job anyways. It sucked, it was the best thing. And it's like, it's like a way to protect their ego, right? Because it's embarrassing for anyone to tell someone that they got fired from a job or for, from Holden's perspective to say that he flunked out of school. And he doesn't want to say that, so instead he says he left it, like as if it was his own choice. And then he seemingly brags about Pincy by stating, you probably heard of it, right? But at the same time, he's almost poking fun at it about how ridiculous the advertisements are and how things are rarely what they're advertised to be. And we always seem to be constantly sold a lie especially in modern, the modern era and with businesses and corporations. And they're all trying to sell you this ideal image and this fantasy and you go and you're like, it's not, it's not perfect. It can still be great, but it's not always perfect. Like Disneyland's a great example if you've ever been. It's amazing, yeah, but they paint that as this perfect, the happiest place on earth, they call it, right? But you go on a busy day, it's, there's people everywhere, there's, there's couples and with children, by the end of the day, they're like fighting, the children are crying you're you're kind of getting annoyed. It's not this amazing place all the time, right? Waiting in line for hours, getting on the red. Um, and then perhaps this is also a foreshadowing to the novel because adulthood is almost a lie as well, right? Well, we're sold this advertisement of what it is to be an adult and rarely, if ever, is it ever what we are told it is. Thus, now we have more knowledge of being sold false ideals with marketing pervading every single point of our life. There's almost this apprehension to make a full transition into being a mature adult. And I feel like it's even more present now, especially because people are allowing us to stay children, right? Society's allowing us to give, give them more of our freedoms. If they take more responsibility, we'll give them our freedoms, right? And marketers, like I said, businesses, they've sold us this idea about that we never have to grow up. But yeah, that's a topic for another time. But it is this kind of idea like, don't grow up, be a Toys R Us kid. If you, were, if you remember those commercials. I don't wanna grow up, I'm a Toys R Us kid. Yeah, um, we've seen false ads for schools or places of destinations. And there's always this, the photos giving us false images, false ideal of what it is. You know, you go in expecting these moments and rarely do they happen. The photos you see on social media with Instagram with people traveling on these destinations, like on YouTube, well-edited vlogs, and we imagine ourselves and our trip to be just like that and then you get there, it's not as, as dreamlike as you thought. Even vacations half the time aren't that amazing as you expect. But you go back and pretend it really was once you get back to the real life. But then it's not like this perfect heaven. And I think another thing that Holden's doing here is he's, he's almost elevating himself too at the same time, but also wants to poke fun at the school because, I mean, he, he left it, he, he flunked out. So he wants to say that, you know, it's this, place that's not, there's not a horse, it's a hotshot guy, blah, 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 but he, he wants people to know that it's, it's a pop, it's a, it's supposed to be one of the better schools, a prep school, and people do hear about it, so he wants to let the therapist and the readers know that he was a part of it, right? There's prestige to the name. And we put so much emphasis on school and prestige or companies like and titles. And I went here, I went to, and if you name a Ivy League school, you instantly get credibility and people think, oh my gosh, this guy's so smart, he went there, or she's so smart, they went there, right? Or fancy titles where none of us really know what the title even means, like what does that even, what do you do? 
and they give you this long title and you're just like, I have no idea what that is, but okay, it sounds fancy. And people want fancy titles because a lot of the times their own personality, their own character is really nothing without that title. Right? If you say you're a doctor, if you say you're a lawyer, if you say you're a CFO, CEO, COO, any of those things, you instantly get elevated and that's valued in society. And then they associate that title with you. So then you get valued up there. But if you took away that title, if you weren't that person, who would you be? And the people who put so much emphasis on what they are, when that, let's say they get fired or they retire, they get lost because they don't know who they are without that. Because that was their identity and they never formed a true personality. And that's a dangerous thing. What I want to say is I thought of this maxim as when all stripped away, all that's left is your character. So play, pay very important attention to that character you're building. And that's also a reminder to myself. Okay, let's continue with the book. Since 1888, we have been molding boys into splendid, clear thinking young men. They, Pincy Prep, don't do any damn more molding at Pincy than they do at any other school. And I didn't know anybody there that was splendid and clear thinking and all. Maybe two guys, if that many. And they probably came to Pincy that way. So here is an example of Holden making value and moral judgments on Pincy and the entire school body, right? This is something that seems to occur in our youth when we begin to think we know far more than anyone else, like I mentioned. There's that ignorance that comes with youth. As one begins to become more intelligent, they think everyone is an idiot and that they know more than the rest of the world and therefore they feel that they can be the judge of all. And only when one begins to mature later in life does one obtain the wisdom to admit that they don't know it all, right? True wisdom is admitting that you don't know. Socrates was considered the wisest man by the Oracle of Delphi, I'm pretty positive, by this statement when he admitted that he didn't know anything and she said, you're the wisest man in all of Athens. And once we realize that others know more than us, or at least everyone has something that they can teach us, and that's true, we become more open and willing to learn from others rather than to judge others. Or if you're always open to learn from people, you kind of let down that guard and that ego. There's this idea of that I know it's, it's a struggle for people who are, let's say, educated or have always been told that they're intelligent. You'll see this, or they start becoming it. They want to always, they have this kind of insecurity where they have to assert their dominance and and it's almost like this pissing contest around people who are considered intellectuals where they're not really even trying to learn from each other M majority of them of course there's some really great ones who are mature but a lot of them are still very immature and they're both what they're doing is trying to one-up one another they're trying to say something that's very intelligent very superior and they're both just kind of mentally masturbating right out loud verbal masturbation which is these fancy words and saying a whole lot of nothing and then neither party is really listening, but they're both trying to impress one another. And what would be really great and conducive for learning would be to actually try to figure out what that other person knows that you don't know, instead of trying to figure out what you know, you know that they don't know, to try to one-up them. And it's more of that going on a lot of the time. I mean, it happens across even business fields and things of that nature, especially in the business world as well. But intellectual ones, I just wanted to point out because I've seen that go on quite a bit. But for people who do struggle with that, just understand that like it's, you kind of let yourself, you feel more comfortable when you go in knowing that this person can teach me something and you're, you kind of let your guard down, you, you humble yourself. And by doing that, you become more likable and you learn, actually learn. I think Sam Harris once talked about this, is if you go into conversations and think of them more as like a trade-off, that this person has information and you have information and you're trying to I know this is like a selfish way, but it's probably a better way for most people to think like, hey, I'm gonna extract as much information from this person as possible. And you want to kind of, you know, import more than you export in a way. And if you do that, then you're more likely to at least like in the selfish ego wise is to think like, I'm gonna extract as much information, perhaps you'll learn more and actually listen. And you become more likable because people enjoy teaching actually. They want people to be to inquire and they want to, you know, bestow their wisdom upon somebody and want people to listen. All right, let's get back to this. With youths, there's also a blatant disrespect for what is already built before you arrived, right? You stick your nose to it all, just feel as if everything has always been there. 
electricity, infrastructure, school systems, governments, etc. You tend to forget that it took a lot of hard work and intelligence to really build these things for you and for others. And you just kind of are born into it and we take it for granted. You, you kind of take, you, especially in like our generation, I'm guilty of this too. You think things are supposed to be easy. They're supposed to come easily and you don't realize the hard work that it truly takes to accomplish goals. And even something like that doesn't seem as grand, but creating just a successful business is extremely challenging, right? There's a reason the majority of them fail. And yet we all want to like change the world, but no one wants to change themselves because everyone at, at, at you thinks they're, you know, perfect or superior to everyone else. And I also want to point out Holden's uncertain language once again, and words and phrases like, and all maybe, if that many, probably. Like he goes back, right? Maybe two guys, if that many. And they probably came to Pinsy that way. So he's like switching around, like uncertain. He also mentions that though there's a prestigious title to this school, this name, it's like most, even like Ivy League schools, if you look at the curriculum, they're not that much better than other schools. Like you can still get a very great education at a state school. And same with like this kind of idea, but they put too much emphasis on the name. It's great marketing. The game with Saxon Hall was supposed to be a very big deal around Pensy. It was the last game of the year, and you were supposed to commit suicide or something if old Pinsy didn't win. I remember around 3 o'clock that afternoon, I was standing way the hell up on top of Thompson Hill, right next to this crazy cannon that was in the Revolutionary War and all. So this is the first event Holden decides to tell us, slash the therapist, right? Why is that? Why do you think that is? I want you to think about that. i wow, take this drink of water. And you'll probably see why in a little bit. But look at the way Holden is setting up the story. It's a very big deal around Pinsy, last game of the year, and you were supposed to commit suicide or something if old Pinsy didn't win. So there's a hyperbole again, right? Clearly this means quite a bit to the school, so he's setting it up, therefore it means a lot to Holden as well, since he feels the need to tell us the event and paint the picture in his own Holden sort of way of saying how important this event was to him and all his peers, because he doesn't want to stay, he never wants to straight up say things are very important to him. And you'll see this, it's like an immature way because it feels like it's, a, I don't want to use the cliche, but it's almost like being too cool for school, right? That idea. Like you don't want to say like, oh yeah, this was a huge event because you don't want to seem like it's, you don't want to seem corny or fake or like liking things that are kind of ridiculous because in the big, you know, grand scheme of things, this game really is meaningless. But for those people and at that moment, it is meaningful and it was meaningful to him because clearly it was if he's deciding to tell us about it. And this is the first story he's really telling about it. Like this where he's, he talked about Pincy Prep, but this is a real first story. And he's using the school to say it's important because he doesn't want to say, he doesn't want to admit that he himself found it to be important. So let's continue. I wanted to, I also want to point out though that Holden's class use, use of language supposed to be, we're supposed to, something and all, the uncertainty immature way of thinking of speaking i think we all have the experience of being that person right of knowing a person who talk this way to try to be cool to kind of play things down and also I, he's setting a distance from the story because if he's putting himself and talking about how important it is then that pain is going to be really real well that story's gonna have more emotion but you can set distance and be like well it was like the school thought it was cool i'm just a part of the school but i didn't think it was like this big of a deal so you'll see Holden uses these distancing languages. Like he uses a lot of verbal fillers, but I think it's because he wants to create distance. Because it's an immature way of way, if not truly feeling something and experiencing it by setting up distance. Instead of saying the game with Saxon Hall is a very big deal, he says the game with Saxon Hall was supposed to be a very big deal. Think about how much of a difference that makes. It makes it, makes it seem as if it is no longer a big deal. Right, it's supposed to be. And there were expectations for it to be a very big deal, but it wasn't. It was just supposed to be. But when you hear someone say it is a very big deal, you instantly know the importance that comes with this game. Though the difference seems rather subtle, it makes a giant difference, doesn't it? And Holden uses this to create distance between himself and the story and to play down things, possibly to make himself feel better. And I want to know what you think. So think about that and think about why Holden does this. 
Even if we take it to the next part regarding you were supposed to commit suicide or something, Bold Pinsy didn't win by adding or something. It allows room for the event to not be taken that seriously if Pinsy didn't win. Right? If Holden just said people damn near commit suicide if Pinsy doesn't win, or people have committed suicide and Pinsy doesn't win, the audience, reader, the therapist, all of us, all of us know how important this game is, especially if someone committed suicide because of it, right? But by adding just that small phrase or something, Holden is able to soften and lessen the importance. He also uses the past tense words and telling of his story, making it seem as if the school still doesn't take it seriously, right? Or has ended completely because he isn't there. The school would not suddenly start taking the game lightly just because of Holden's absence, right? And you'll see, they're still gonna be taking, it's still gonna be a big deal. He could still say this game is a big deal because it's a game that happens all the time. One of those traditional games, right? The rivalry games. And this crazy canon that was in the Revolutionary War and all. There's no reason for Holden to say the words and all, even when it comes to solid facts, like the canon being from the Revolutionary War. Holden still cannot get himself to state something in concrete language. Why do you think that is? Why is it so difficult for Holden to state anything concretely and with confidence? Why must he always add uncertainty to his sentences, even something like that that seems meaningless, right? He could have just said a canon that was from the Revolutionary War or a crazy canon that's from the Revolutionary War. We'll continue on page five. Uh, practically the whole school except me was there. Holden is showing the distance he feels from everyone else with this. The isolation from others that he feels, not being able to truly connect. He feels lonely. He being one of the only people at his whole school that isn't in the crowd, right? Cheering on his team. Seemingly being different, not conforming or engaging in group activities. And as a youth even, I think even more so in this culture, we all feel disconnected, lonely, right? Isolated, not a part of the group. And though people may not want to admit it and don't want to be a part of it, people want social connection. We're social creatures, unfortunately. And we want to connect. We want to have meaningful connections with people because that's what makes life amazing and great. So I think many of us could understand and feel that kind of pain that Holden's feeling right now. He's talking about him not being with the rest of the school. And he uses the word practically, rightfully so in this part, because if he did say the whole school, chances are that that statement would be an exaggeration. So here, Holden actually doesn't truly exaggerate when he says practically the whole school, right? If he said the whole school is there except for me, then that just seems too much of it. Like everyone went, just not him. That's too much of an exaggeration. It was a terrible school no matter how you looked at it. And then Holden makes a judgment on the school once again by putting the blame on the school and the students. It allows for him to take the immature role of a victim. To have an excuse for why he went mad and why he ended up where he is, he can blame the school for being terrible and the students not containing any splendid or clear thinking young men, etc., etc. right? I like to be somewhere at least where you can see a few girls around once in a while, even if they're only scratching their arms or blowing their noses or even just giggling or something. So Holden's creating uncertainty and distance by adding at least or once in a while or something. He can't just state things that he likes to be somewhere where he can see girls. He seemingly has to constantly create all these twists and turns to create the distance he feels that's needed for him. I also think this displays Holden's immaturity, his inability to recognize what he wants or what he likes. He can't choose. He's uncertain because he doesn't know who he is. Many of us struggle with that even when we are past the rite of passage age. But this insecurity and search for identity is felt strongest when you are in that transitional stage and age, right? You don't know who you are. You don't know your identity. You don't know who you want to be. You don't know your likes, your dislikes. You think you do, right? But a lot of it is just given to you by society, by parents, by, you know, teachers, etc., businesses, corporations, etc., etc. And... During this transitional stage, it makes it harder that we must also choose we want to study, right? Where we want to study, who we want to study, you know, I mean, if we want to study at all. And we have to make all these crucial life decisions at a time when we don't even know what we want because we don't even know who we are. You're asking a teenager to do that. It's just too much. I know it was too much for me when I was growing up. I just picked something that my mom told me that would be a job that would be around because I had no idea. Right? I wasn't one, those people are the luckiest, the ones I think are the ones who are like children and they know what they want to be. They're like, I've always known. Yeah, and if one chooses, one must take responsibility in that choice, which 
aids to why choosing is so difficult for us and why many of us try to avoid it because we are trying to avoid responsibility. It's an immature way of being a hope to revert and like stay a child and have our parents make all our choices for us and be responsible for us rather than having to grow up and be responsible for ourselves. And unfortunately, I think this is kind of going on more and more with society as a whole, right? And state government and everything of that nature is like, if they give us security, comfort, provide for us and take the responsibility, we'll willingly give up our freedoms and stay kind of immature children because it's easier, right? It's and easier doesn't make things more fulfilling. Easier doesn't mean you're going to have no suffering. It's quite often the other way, right? If you struggle for some reason, you, you suffer less. But when things are too easy you and you're too comfortable, for, for some reason, us human beings, we can't, we can't stay content with that. We need something to strive against, strive for, and overcome. I think Dostoevsky was great at pointing this out before many people... Notes from the Underground is one of the books that he mentioned that. I don't know the exact phrase, so please don't kill me if I say it wrong. But it, it's along the lines of if the human race was, you know, reached a point in society where it was like this utopia where the human race didn't have to do anything but just have sex and eat cakes, they would figure out a way to destroy society because they would want to try to establish their own will. They would want to have something to kind of overcome and ruin this disruption to show that they're still a human being. And, and I think it's pretty clear and obvious we have more mental disease probably than ever before, but yet we have all the comforts. It's rare if you're not going to, well, COVID time's a little different, but prior to COVID time, it was rare if you, you know, wouldn't have, like everyone kind of practically had a smartphone, a place to stay, weren't going to starve, right? You could get a job if you wanted a job before COVID. But yet, there's more mental disease, more depression, loss of connection, more people killing themselves. Right. All right, let's get back to the book. Old Selma Thurmer, she was the headmaster's daughter. Showed up at the games quite often, but she wasn't exactly the type that drove you mad with desire. She was a pretty nice girl, though. I sat next to her once in the bus from Town, and we sort of struck up a conversation. I liked her. And it's his classic use of language. He's kind of putting her down at first, like she's not the kind of girl that drove you mad with desire. And then it's pretty nice girl. Instead of just saying she was a, a nice girl, he has to say, he has to use an extra adjective as well. That lessens the description of nice, which is even worse. Leaving room for her to not always be nice. Right? He calls his parents nice. He calls her pretty nice. Not settling on a single judgment on her. Of her. This allows for her to be thought of and imagined as being someone who is capable of not being nice on the rare occasion. But for the most part, people could think of her as a pleasant person, and I think many people wouldn't find the description of pretty nice as being the most sought for description. If you think about it, would you want someone to describe you as just being pretty nice? Like, how's, how's so and so? Hmm, they're pretty nice. You wouldn't be too pleased with that person who told you that. Of course, there's a lot worse things to be called, but. It's not the most admirable thing to strive for, just to be pretty nice. Imagine that on a tombstone. Blah, blah. He was pretty nice, or she was pretty nice. Additionally, like I said, he uses the word nice once again. He always has to add something to balance out the evaluation and not to commit to one side, because he said his parents are nice and all, but touchy as hell, and she's pretty nice, right? And also I want to point out Holden saying we sort of struck up a conversation. Something that seems so minimal still is incredibly challenging for Holden. To just say that he struck up conversation, he has to add sort of. Leaving it ambiguous, the reader can't fully embrace the image of two people talking since we have to take into the account the phrase sort of. What is a sort of conversation? Is that like small talk? And perhaps you have an idea in your head or in your mind, but the idea varies immensely. The interpretation becomes wider because all of us have a different interpretation of what a sort of conversation is. If you had to write it down, I'm sure you get different answers all the time, even with conversations, but at least that is more consistent than a sort of conversation. The vast majority of us can settle on an agreement of what a conversation looks like, while a sort of conversation allows for more of a debate in what exactly that looks like and is. 
And what is surprising here is that Holden actually says that he liked her. He doesn't employ a word to lessen that judgment or statement, which is very weird. It's amazing that Holden doesn't say he sort of liked her, right? Or kind of liked her, or I liked her, or something, or I liked her and all. And then why do you think this is? Ask yourself that, why? She's the first girl that Holden discusses. What do you think the importance of that is? He does mention that she was at the game often because she was the headmaster's daughter. So perhaps the telling of the story about the game brought up a pleasant memory of her, which happens, right? We talk about things and someone pops in her head, we hear a song, we smell it. We smell a certain scent and m memories flood into our mind. Uh, once again, he mentions that she doesn't, she's not the type, she wasn't exactly the type that drove you mad with desire. She had a big nose and her nails were all bitten down and bleedy looking and she had all those damn falsies that point all over the place, but you felt sort of sorry for her. So after he just told us that he liked her, he has to say she has a big nose, her nails, etc. So though Holden finally managed to say something concretely in the fact that he liked her, there weren't any exceptions or caveats to that statement, right? He manages to bring Selma down by this description of her. So though he told us he liked her, he then immediately has to go, oh wait, I have to make sure that I put her down so I can play it kind of cool again, right? It's not the most glowing description. And personally, to me, it's a method that one sees while in school when a person likes a boy or a girl but then covers up their feelings by trying to put down the other person and say bad things about them, right? And I hope you know what I mean when I say this. Like if a friend tells you, I like her, but she's, you know, she's annoying, she talks too much or something along those lines. I used to have a friend, a roommate that used to do that quite often. Like he would have a girl that we all thought was amazing, but he would find everything wrong with her and try to put her down instantly. But it was his own insecurities because the girl he probably thought was better, too good for him. She probably was, but yeah, he would always have these kind of caveats. It was an immature way of thinking and insecurity from his point, point of view when instead of looking for all the best qualities that she has, instantly he would find all the worst qualities and for why she was not good and why they should break up and why they shouldn't be together because he was casting his own projection, his own insecurities onto that girl, right? Because then it gives him a reason to break up and lets his ego not have to worry and feel so insecure because when we date people there, they're like a, a mirror, a reflection in a way, and they can cast these, that we, we project our ideal, but at the same time, for instance, a pretty woman for a man, right? They, the man is flooded with all his insecurities instantly and, and has to try to figure out, okay, the woman's looking at me and I want to be, you want to be this ideal person. People either rise up to try to be that person or the, a lot of people end up self-sabotaging, right? I've done that too you self-sabotage because, and you think of these reasons why they shouldn't break up, why they should break up with you and you try to be a pity party and you start showing them why you're not good enough because you, you're messing up on purpose in a way, subconsciously and consciously, but typically it's subconscious. It's like the whole Adam and Eve idea, right? The woman makes the man self-aware and become self-conscious. Now let's get back to the story. He has to say sort of because he doesn't want to say he felt sorry for her because that sounds bad, right? I sort of felt sorry for her. It sounds far more cruel and harsh to say he felt sorry. It allows the typical wriggle room. The sort of phrase is also Holden's telltale way to display his uncertainty and insecurity. The ambivalent second guessing style enforces a sense of Holden as an uncertain character who doesn't know himself or his own desires. And once again, that is why people call him the unreliable narrator. But I just think he's just a kid. He's like all of us, right? Uh, immature, you don't know who you are, you're uncertain about yourself, so your speech is going to be uncertain. And I, I still say, I still talk like that quite a bit where I have to catch myself in the way I say, and like, or and all, or kind of, sort of, quite. I use quite too much. I may have just pointed that out to you now, if you're listening, you're gonna realize every time I say it, what I liked about her, Selma Thurman. Selma Thurmer, that's who she's talking about. She didn't give you a lot of horse manure about what a great guy her father was. She probably knew what a phony slob he was. This is what Holden likes about her. This is what he's claiming he likes about her. After Holden's day today, like Selma without saying something like, I sort of liked her, he then manages to lessen the statement's power by giving the reader a horrible description of her, right? And then he finishes it off by saying that what he liked about her was that she didn't tell him about how great her father, who's a headmaster, was. He doesn't mention anything about Selma's personality, 
meaning we don't really get to know who she is. We do not get an insight into her character other than that she was a pretty nice girl. We don't know her personally, we just know her physically, right? And the physical description's bad. And then the only thing he says he likes about her is that she didn't talk about her father being this great guy. It's vague, it's, it's not concrete. He doesn't get any, yeah, no detail about the personality. And then he thinks her father is a phony slob, right? Which is another judgment on Holden's part about someone else. He's always judging people and putting them down, right? A phony slob. Though he likes Selma and he's felt sort of, sort of sorry for her. I mean, it's all over the place. He's uncertain. He doesn't know his own feelings. And he's trying to believe that that's the reason he liked her, just for that sole reason, which is probably not true. But we can't ever know because he won't tell us more than that. Because, yeah, that's the end of, uh, that's the end of the tell of Selma. The first girl he tells us he likes, but he doesn't really tell us why he liked her. So the reason I was standing way up on Thompson Hill instead of down at the game was because I just got back from New York with the fencing team. I was the goddamn manager of the fencing team. Very big deal. We'd gone into New York that morning for the fencing meet with McBurney School, only we didn't have the meet. I left all the foils and equipment and stuff on the goddamn subway. It wasn't all my fault. I had to keep getting up to look at the map so we know where to get off. So we got back to Pincy around 2.30 instead of around dinner time. The whole team ostracized me the whole way back on the train. It was pretty funny in a way. And so there's a lot to unpack in this paragraph. You can assume this is kind of getting to the meat of what's happening, right? Of why he's telling this story about the game. Holden seems to use sarcasm by saying a very big deal, right? When he says, I was a goddamn manager. He uses that word goddamn again. Defense team, very big deal. So what do you guys think? I think he's almost using sarcasm to cover up the hurt he felt from being ostracized by the team. It's not a, that's not a good feeling to be ostracized by all your peers and to let them down. So he's almost making a joke as if it isn't a big deal, right? But it is. And once again, like the same with the football game, this whole fancy team manager, if you unpack the whole idea about life, that you can kind of, you can justify and make valid arguments for why that's not a big deal at all, right? It's can seem something so minuscule, but in that current moment, it's very meaningful. Those feelings he felt were meaningful. Being the 15 manager of the team was a big deal at that time and to those people into that school. So to say it wasn't, is just a lie in itself. I think I don't like that when people try to say those certain things because it's not really true. I'm sure you hear this, people try to say like high school, for instance, when people say it will pass or it's not that big of a deal, you forget about this. It's like, yeah, you maybe you will, but at that current moment, it's meaningful to them. It's impactful. It's really impacting their lives and it can shape them. And to say that they're completely meaningless experiences what you're having in high school, that's a lie. If people try to tell you that, they're just trying to make you feel better, but it doesn't make you feel better. Like the person who you're telling that to, like the high school kid, knows that that's a lie because to them, you may say it's not a big deal and they forget about it when they're adults. They're still going through it, especially if they're a freshman. They still have years to go through it and those years matter. They're living those each day and it's like, that's meaningful. So I think they're a very big deal. I think this was a very big deal to hold in. And here it is again, he's separated from others once again. So he's alone while the whole entire team ostracized him and despised him during that time. So not fun, that is to be suffering. He tries not to be responsible, showing his immaturity once again by saying it wasn't all my fault, right? He's trying to throw the responsibility off of him. He doesn't want to own up to his own mistake. He can't take the blame, therefore he has to set some distance. He tries to lessen the hurt he feels from the event by saying it was pretty funny in a way, right? He's trying to laugh it off at the end. So he's trying a little of everything, right? He's trying to poke fun and make, have it be a sarcastic idea about it just being a big deal about him being a fencing, man, fencing team manager. And then he tells us what happened, right? They were supposed to go to this meet, but he left all the foils. It was all and everything on the subway, what he was responsible for. That's his responsibility as a manager is to carry the foils, make sure all the equipment gets to the guys and gets back to the school, right? But he was trying to say that he had also look at the map and do two things at once because they didn't know where to get off. And then he doesn't, 
and then so the whole team obviously ostracized him because he left the foils. They missed the match. They didn't get a chance to do that. They had a four friend most likely. And so they ostracized him, right? Probably made fun of him, probably talked bad about him, you know, cast looks, probably talked, whispered to one another and he feeling like crap, right? Instead of owning the mistake and apologizing, he probably just ignored them. And there's people who get like, um, it's like two ways to kind of handle it a lot of the times. You can either own up to mistakes and then ask for forgiveness, which is the best, or you get, there's some people that are so stubborn that they would get more mad and be like, F these people, I don't need them. They're dumb anyways, and they try to play like that, but they're just carrying that negative energy and it doesn't get released, right? And so at the last event, he tries to fix that event by saying it was pretty funny in a way. But we can imagine how painful that was. If you can just put yourself in that situation, how you'd be upset with yourself, right? You're mostly disappointed with yourself. And on top of that, all these other people are disappointed on you. And as a teenager, can you imagine trying to handle that? I, I don't, thankfully I never had experience of that nature, right? And all the responsibilities on you. But if you have, I'm sure you can imagine the suffering that he's feeling and having to relive that tale. The emotions are probably still there, clearly. He can't even tell it about saying like, it was my fault. He said it wasn't my fault. It wasn't all my fault. He's still creating distance. He still hasn't lived up to that part of himself, that, that memory that still holds so much uh, potent energy that it's still pulling him down and he can't get past it and really admit his mistakes. But yeah, he was in charge of the whole equipment. He was complete responsibility. The entire team's angry at him. Like how isolated would you feel? And uh, clearly this event affected Holden because this is where he's starting his recounting, right? One of the, it's a terrible memory and it's holding so much energy. So I think a lot of the times, if he's trying to trace where his mental breakdown started, I'm assuming this is why he's starting with that because it, it was a bad event that's leading to more bad events because this is before he even gets kicked out of the school, right? Oh, here he is, he's saying it now. The, the other reason I wasn't down at the game was because I was on my way to say goodbye to old Spencer, my history teacher. He knew I wasn't coming back to Pensy. I forgot to tell you about that, they kicked me out. I was flunking four subjects and not applying myself at all. And all, they gave me frequent warning to start applying myself, especially around midterms when my parents came up for a conference with old Thurmer, but I didn't do it, so I got the ax. So not only did he mess up with the subway and the fencing equipment as a fencing manager, he's getting kicked out of school. So it's like double trauma happening. And it's a lot to ask for a teenager to carry, especially if he doesn't have this, probably he doesn't have the relationship with a parent to really talk to and mentor him and allow someone to kind of trust and guide him out of it. And if he has to hold all that himself. So just another dramatic event for Holden, leaving the fencing equipment on the subway and then getting kicked out of the school because he failed four subjects. And these two things Holden was responsible for. He had the ability to, to he, this is like, he has no one to blame for either of these. These are all his own doing. And both times he failed, like his ability to be responsible. So this is important because Holden wants to remain you know, dependent, he wants to remain a child as we'll see throughout this book, but also at that age where he wants to grow up but scared to. And we see this with his language, his inability to commit, his inability to own up to his actions, right? He can't own up to these actions and he can't take full responsibility. And the way he always seeks to place blame on others and to be the victim, that's childish behavior. And when he did have responsibility, he failed them both. So that's probably making him more, have more trepidation in regards to making that full transition into an adulthood. Because he, as an adult, you're going to have to take on more responsibility and the little responsibility that he does possess, school, being a fencing manager, he failed miserably. He flunked and he let the whole team down. So that's probably making him more timid and frightened and apprehensive to actually become an adult and to revert back to a child to feel like I'm not ready for this, I'm failing. And I think this is what Holden was feeling. And it's why he's bringing it up because the first two opportunities of, to show that he could be a responsible adult, he failed miserably. But at least, in this example, he admits that he didn't apply himself after after the warning. So at least he's not trying to completely blame someone else, right? 
but though earlier Holden on page four, Holden does say he left Princey Prep. I left Princey Prep right? instead of saying he got the axe, but he said he got kicked out here. But it still doesn't excuse his behavior, and I think he knows that. Right? And he's probably embarrassed because his parents had to come and do a conference with the headmaster, and that's embarrassing for anyone. To it's it's one of the worst feelings I would uh, I would say, and I'm sure many were you many of you will agree that disappointing your parents is horrible it's better to have them angry at you right that whole cliche it's true though you'd rather have your parents angry but when they say they're disappointed in you it's far worse and you just feel like complete crap you feel so small and you just want to curl up in a ball right disappear for a little bit find a time machine and the question to you i want to put to you all is of course, I just mentioned how Holden had responsibility and he failed twice, right? It made him more frightened to take next steps into adulthood because there's always that fear of failure that prevents us from doing so much. We're always scared to fail. And can you think of a time you were given responsibility and you disappointed yourself and others and let yourself down and others down and fail? Do you remember how you felt? And did you get angry and resentful and just want to give up? And did you fear trying again? Or did you take the get back on the horse kind of cliche, right? And go back at it and try again or take responsibility and think like, how can I improve? That's a sign of maturity, but I'm sure there's times where you failed and ran away from it, right? I know I have. But I came up with this maxim a while back that I'm attempting to try to live by. And I think it's a good one to share. And it is, I think it's better to die a failure than to die a coward. And I really believe that. Let's go back to here. And I think it's important to note that Holden let down his parents in regard to flunking out. Like I mentioned, it's, it sucks. It, he, his parents knew he was failing and though he had the opportunity and he had a second chance to make things right, right? They gave him a warning, they said he can do better. He can make him proud, he could turn it around. Like his parents could be disappointed, but he could be like, hey, I'm going to get my act together, don't worry. And his parents could have, said like, wow, Holden, you took the responsibility, you're making a mistake. And instead, what Holden did was he just continued to fail. He didn't make improvements. He didn't look at himself and think, okay, I'm failing, what can I do to improve so that I don't flunk out? And that just probably adds to the disappointment. He, you'll see later on in the book, he doesn't want to go back early because he doesn't want his parents to know that he flunked out because he knows that they'd be extremely disappointed in him. And then I also want to point out, there's, this probably is why he has such animosity towards old Thurmer, the headmaster, Selma's father, in which he called a phony slob. It, it could be because he kicked Holden out, right? Though the blame lies completely on Holden. He was given a warning to get his grades up and he still did not apply himself. And I think it's, ch it's a childish victimhood way when you know or when you become resentful and you want to make the other person and the entire world the villains, though you're your, you're your own worst enemy. It's easier to say the whole world's the problem, right? But in reality, it's not. It's, it's far better to know that you're the problem because if the whole world's a problem, then you're going to continue to suffer because the chances of you changing the whole world are slim. But you can change yourself by just small little behaviors every single day. Uh, there's a famous line in the cocktail party uh, by uh, Elliot, I forgot his first name. Sorry about this. One of my favorite plays, though. He's a he's a poet. Oh, crap, it's, I, I forgot it. I can't get his name. Anyways, it's called a cocktail party, and there's a woman in it who is talking to a, a therapist, and she even says that she hopes she's the problem. And I think the therapist therapist asked why. She says because if the whole world's a problem, then I'm practically screwed, right? Because the chance to change the whole world. It's probably not going to happen right? and your suffering is going to persist but it's better that you're the problem but victims always want to blame everyone else because it gets them it leaves it relieves them of the responsibility it alleviates the pain in a way and protects your ego to say it's everyone else and you don't have to change right it doesn't force you to change because you can continue to be yourself because you're thinking you're scared to change that's a childish way you're like i don't want to change i don't want to take responsibility i don't want to own up to my actions I want to remain a child and so I'll just blame the whole world but that kind of thing becomes super pathetic no one likes a victim 
Think about the people you respect, the people you admire, the people you look up to. They're the people that take responsibility, that take chances, that that don't blame others, right? They're never, they're never the victims. They don't allow themselves to be pitied or to feel pity for themselves. Those are the people that you respect and the people that you look at with kind of disgust and repulsion, or especially if they're adults, right? Or someone who is a parent or a mentor, or a person who's supposed to be in like a mentor position, a leadership position, but they're not leaders. They're constantly like a boss or something of that nature. And they want to play victims, want people to pity them. They don't want to take any responsibility. You look down upon those people, right? You, you, there is this kind of feeling of disgust with them and you feel like they're being pathetic. And I think that's huge because as a child, you kind of can get away with it. But when you become, you know, in your 20s, it starts becoming less, 30s, 40s. And if you're in your 50s and you're still become, you're still acting as a victim, right? It's, it's, not, a, it's not a pretty sight at all you would be hard pressed to find anybody that really like wants to be around you. People aren't going to look up at you in a positive manner and it's going to going to be hard to attract a maid. If you have children, they're not going to be particularly proud of you if you're constantly blaming the world, playing victim and wanting to have a pity party. Pity is a cruel evil. You should never want to be pitied and you should never pity people. All right, let's get back to you the book so like i said the whole blame lies of lies on holden right about the school but he's trying to blame on thermer in a way by calling him a phony slob because he's mad at him for kicking him out and i believe these two events led to holden being more resentful towards the idea of responsibility and maturity since he blew those chances both those chances and probably feared that he would continue to let down himself and others if he was to be continue to be given more responsibility. And I think that's why he started off with these two letdowns and why he's ended up in the place he did. And it's a great start for the story. And I'm gonna stop here because the podcast and slash lecture is running long and I don't want it to go too long. But I'll continue with chapter one and maybe I'll pour into chapter two. But we're still on page six. Next one we'll start on page seven. But I'm, I hope you, you enjoyed uh, it's an amazing book and ask yourself some of these questions already about that I mentioned rewatch it I'll post it too on the bottom and at the end of chapter one I'll have five questions at the end of each lecture I'll have five questions for you to do by yourself you can email me if you like but at least do them to yourself and think and wonder and it can allow you to kind of work through your own issues and hopefully transition because that's kind of the point of books a lot of the times is you can learn about human life and learn about yourself, especially in a book like Catching the Rye. I know it, it does it for me and it's doing it again, is when you feel kind of stuck in those ways and you can see your own. It's far easier to see your own mistakes when you're seeing it in somebody else, right? If you have to look at your own mistakes through your own eyes, it's a lot more challenging. But we can all learn from Holden's mistakes and his childish ways and immature ways and we can improve upon our own because it reflects and we say wait i'm relating to this why am i relating to this oh crap i am like holden and i don't want to be like that right some people may want to be like holden that's a childish way holden is he's a great character he's likable right but you don't want to be holden you want to improve but thank you for listening my name is frank i will be doing uh, chapter, well, finish chapter one and then chapter two in the next video, the next lecture series. Thank you. Bye.